All right, I think we'll get started. Um, I want to thank Brian Rock uh, for helping us uh, facilitate today's session. And uh, we'll get started and uh, try to be respectful of everyone's time. And then as uh, people jump on, uh, they'll, they'll, they'll catch right on. So uh, good afternoon and uh, welcome to today's session, Reimagining Law Enforcement, Skills Needed for 21st Century Careers. Uh, I'd like to welcome our Niagara University students, as well as a number of students who are looking at NU as a possible destination for their college career. We have more than 60 people registered for this session, which in these days of Zoom and Google Meet fatigue is very good. So we hope it will be time well spent. Across the country, cities and towns, and yes, even universities, are having conversations regarding their police, and what we want out of the men and women in uniform who serve our communities. Perspectives and opinions vary widely. And in some communities, these conversations are extremely difficult and highly charged. Is what we have now what we want in the future? And if not, then what would reimagined law enforcement look like? Obviously, that's a large question, one that can't be answered in an hour or so webinar. So we'll try to focus on one aspect of this question. For our purposes at Niagara University, it's important that the young men and women who go through our criminal justice program are well prepared and have the skills they need to best serve the communities where they'll work. We realize that not every student or prospective student on this call will choose a career in law enforcement, but most any career in criminal justice and certainly in entry level positions is going to put you in contact with people citizens. To this end, the Department of Criminal Justice has created a new course offered for the first time this past spring called Careers in Criminal Justice, which we developed in direct collaboration with the Office of Career Services. We are again partnering with Career Services and putting on this event, so I want to thank our Director of Career Services, Stephanie Morris, and our Assistant Director, Mike Skaronsky. Today, we're excited to welcome Melissa Costa to Niagara University, though truth be told, Melissa's been on campus before as part of a pre-conference for the Rose Bentley Lee Ostapenko Center for Race Equality and Mission. Melissa is going to share her experiences as a clinical social worker over the past three years, riding along with the New Bedford Police Department in Massachusetts and responding to calls involving juveniles and mental health. She will share how those lessons learned may offer ideas and guidance for how we at Niagara University can better train and prepare our students. Following Melissa's remarks, we will have reflections and observations from Carlton Kane, retired deputy superintendent of the Niagara Falls Police Department, and from Lieutenant Julie Kratz, sheriff's deputy for the Niagara County Sheriff's Office and co-director of the Niagara County Law Enforcement Academy that is housed here on campus at NU. Their full bios are available through the link where you registered. Following everyone's remarks, we will move into a Q&A session. Kyle Schwindler, Senior Assistant Director of Admissions will monitor the chat. Uh, we anticipate a solid hour or so for this session, uh, but we hope no one minds if we go over um, a little bit. At this time, I would like to turn it over to Dr. Talia Harmon, Chair of the Criminology and Criminal Justice Department for her official welcome. Thank you so much, Dr. Taylor. It is my pleasure to be here tonight uh, or late this afternoon to welcome both prospective students, current students, and our esteemed alumni, as well as the featured speaker for this very, very important and timely panel. Um, I am so pleased and honored to be able to make some welcoming remarks. Uh, so, um, Without further ado, I would love to welcome Melissa Costa, who is a licensed clinical social worker with over 15 years of experience of working with children, youth, families, and adults in a variety of settings. Melissa currently works for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts Department of Mental Health as a children's, youth, and families case manager supervisor, as well as a services integration specialist. She also currently works for North Star Learning Centers as the inaugural diversion and assistance clinician with the New Bedford Police Department. She participates in ride-along activities with police officers 
assessing for mental health crises and substance abuse while offering recommendations to police and community members regarding local resources as well as referrals. It is this work on which she will pr present today and I'm very much looking forward to hearing her remarks. Uh, I also want to put out a, a real sincere thanks to Carlton Kane and Julie for uh, being here to give their insights as well as you know, just supporting uh, NU as NU alumni. So without further ado, uh, I will turn this over now to Melissa. Okay, thank you. Um, so excuse my nerves for the opening remarks. That's usually how it kind of goes with me. Um, so yeah, I was um, honored and privileged to be asked to be a part of this panel like um, Dave, um, Professor Taylor has mentioned, I have been on the campus of Niagara University previously for other conferences. So I am pleased to be back in this forum. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Okay, so just a little bit more about myself. Um, like she said, I'm a licensed independent clinical social worker and in the state of Massachusetts, that's the highest level you can get within the social work field. Um, I received my bachelor's in sociology social services from the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth. And then uh, I got my master's in social work from Boston University where I special, where I majored in clinical major, but with a macro certification. And I recently completed a child and adolescent trauma certificate program from the Rhode Island College School of Social Work. Um, I do work full time for the Department of Mental Health. I actually started with the Department of Mental Health as a crisis clinician where we would go out into the community as well as into hospital settings, evaluating people and determining which level of care would best suit them, whether it's in a locked facility, a voluntary facility, or remaining in the community with additional outpatient services. I, um, in 2017, I am the inaugural, the first ever in New Bedford to do the diversion and assistance clinic um, program as their clinician. I also um, have worked for uh, Bridgewater State University as a field instructor within the School of Social Work. I am also very involved in the community. That is very important to me, especially in doing this work as I'm doing the ride-alongs. It's important that I know what kind of resources and referrals and programs are out there so that, that way I can make the best match for the people that I'm coming across. A lot of my passion comes from working uh, with the YWCA of Southeastern Massachusetts, whose mission is eliminating racism and empowering women and promoting peace, justice, freedom, and dignity for all. Uh, through, that, through the agency, I have um, achieved a racial justice facilitation as well as facilitating youth police dialogue. So that's when we bring together adolescents in the community along with police officers. And we do about a six week program. Um, not uh, it's a six session program and we're, we're just, we're being real. We're having honest conversations and to see how the officers come in and how the youth come in and then how they leave six, after six sessions is really something to be seen. I, I can speak about it, but unless you witness it, it just wouldn't give it the justice that it needs, that it deserves. I am currently through the organization also co-chairing a police and criminal justice, racial justice working group where we are developing action steps to address racism within policing and criminal justice. So that work is ongoing um, as we speak. I'm also a member of JDAI, which stands for Juvenile Detention Alternative Initiative of Bristol County. That's a community collaboration looking to reduce youth who get involved with the juvenile justice system. And when they do get involved, it's about making sure that we provide wraparound services. I am also a member of the Greater New Bedford Suicide Prevention Coalition, um, where I have also received um, a state proclamation for the work that I've done within this uh, zero suicide. Um, I am a member of the CCIT, which I'm gonna get more into in a, um, in a couple of slides. And I have also um, done some civic engagement by running for city council. Um, that has, that's definitely an interesting process as well. Next. So we are going to take a quick look at um, a video on a different kind of force. This is a mental health unit within the police department in San Antonio, Texas. 
Um, and then I will see you on the other side of this video. 3262. Good. We're getting information that she may be around this location. Is there any chance we can fuel up here? 3370. 370 on the way. Okay, who's in your Uh This is her husband. Hey, how you doing? Hey, Officer Stevens, Ernie. Lewis, Lewis. Hey, Lewis, my partner Gabe. Hello, sir. How long has she been acting this way? Uh, it's been since Saturday. We, she just believes that I'm having an affair and that I have a woman that I've gotten pregnant in our ceiling, Heidi. I'm sorry you're having a bad day. It's been the past four days. That past four days have been bad? Yes, sir. Okay, well, we're, we're here because we don't want you to have any more bad days, right? And we want to get you some help. In the police academy, uh, we had no training on what it was like to deal with somebody that was mentally ill or in a crisis. I was probably the last officer that you wanted to help a loved one that was in a mental health crisis. She's watching us sleep. And I told him, I could be in the living room. I can hear this whole conversation. So you actually hear this I girl hear both talking. of them. Okay. But now in the mental health unit, every single call we're responding to is a mental health crisis. Uh, I'm not sure. Do you hear her right now as we're talking? He's talking to her. He's talking to her? Because he's actually out if by the... you want to go to my room, go here. You want me to I go to your room? I just want to say it loud because he's going to shut up. Are you hearing? Are you hearing it right now? God, I don't He's hear anything. telling her, I need her here. Okay, I, I don't hear anything. I'm, really I'm so sorry, I don't. I'm, I'm just being honest with you. I'm not gonna lie to you. I'm not saying that I don't believe that you don't hear him. I believe this is very real for you. I just don't hear anything right now. <laughs> I don't want I promise to go you. anywhere. I know you I don't. Do nothing wrong. You, you're right, you didn't do anything wrong. I'm getting kicked out of my own house because nope. somebody don't come out. No. You're extremely <laughs> agitated right now and stressed out. I'm just broken. I'm shattered. My whole heart is shattered. Okay, you're using words like shattered and broken. Okay, if you were my sister, okay, there's no way I would leave you in this condition. There's no way. Dallas, I want to speak words of emergency. Yeah, my son needs to be taken to Parker and bipolar schizophrenia. Make sure they train uh, police officers. Okay. Bipolar schizophrenia. What's going on? You drop that for me. You drop that for me, guy. Jay! Drop it! Jay! Drop it! Jay! Why he shot him? More conservative estimates say that those suffering from a mental illness account for almost one quarter of all fatalities involving law enforcement. Get on the ground now! This slide identifies every single officer involved shooting. All of those that are identified in red showed some sign of mental illness. Oh, they can't look down. Oh, they can't look down. Is there a crisis in the United States when it comes to mental health issues? Absolutely. People with mental illness are overrepresented in every aspect of the criminal justice system. So I work on a specialized unit that only deals with people in a mental health crisis. Almost everything about how I respond to calls goes against what most would believe. I'm in plain clothes. I drive an unmarked car. My weapon is concealed. And for the last nine years, the only weapon that I've used is my ability to communicate. Are you some kind of like therapist or something? No, I'm, I'm a police officer, just like just like him. I don't want to say we do unconventional policing. We just approach certain situations differently. I'm not trash. No, oh, of course not. No. no. I come from a very nice family. I know you do. You know that you're going to deal with someone in crisis that night. You know that someone's going to need your help. San Antonio police, are you OK? Police have a misconception of mental health. I want the old Chris. Those voices just have total control of him. He don't trust anybody. Mental illness is not unique to the United States of America. What is unique is this dynamic of unarmed citizens being killed by the people who are supposed to protect and serve us. Like, is that the first thing that they think of? Is to pull their weapon and shoot somebody? No one with mental illness deserves to die because they're already dying inside, suffering. We have to change the way culturally that we look at how we succeed in police work. I have an opportunity every single time I'm called to change somebody's perspective.
Okay, welcome back. Um, so as you can see through that program, not every police department has a mental health unit. You know, they usually have some kind of maybe homicide unit, detective unit, gang unit, but not necessarily a mental health unit. So that's where I come into play within the New Bedford Police Department. Um, as you can see in the video also there at the very end, they kind of share the statistic. And later on in the video, if you continue to, to look that up and watch it, it says anywhere between, that one said one in 10, more likely it's like 20 to 25% of all police calls have some kind of underlying mental health condition. But as you saw, they receive nationally about 10 out of 840 hours, which is just about 1% of their training. So if they're receiving 1% of their training regarding mental health and yet 20 to 25% of the calls that they go on are gonna have some kind of mental health issue, they're not being trained for the population that they're gonna be serving. That's a huge discrepancy and something that needs to be addressed as um, changes are coming. So the goal of the diversion program is to, you know, aims to address the underlying causes of illegal behavior without drawing youth deeper into the juvenile justice system. So let's use the example, a youth comes into school with a knife. So you might call the school resource officer, the SRO, or maybe you just call regular 911, right? So that's gonna drag that youth deeper into the juvenile justice system. Whereas a social worker or a counselor within the school is gonna look at, you know, well, why did they bring the knife to school? Is, are they not feeling safe when they're home? Are they not feeling safe at school? Are they not feeling safe while en route from home to school? You know, what is at the root cause? And if we can address that and put systems in place to solve that, then we can do away with entering into the juvenile justice system. Um, to achieve positive outcomes for these youth juvenile justice, behavioral health and education systems, we must increase collaboration, continuity of care and access to integrated evidence-based or promised practicing screening and treatment models. So it's a whole wraparound model of doing things. You know, it takes a village to raise a child. Same thing here, right? Looking at the schools, looking at the um, treatment providers and aiming to decrease criminal recidivism, enhance public safety and improve access to care for those who need it. Next. Um, the, na there are several models within the national pre-arrest jail diversion. Um, the first one is the CCIT, which I, um, you know, within New Bedford, um, it's a, so the CCIT is a community crisis intervention team. It's a collaborative effort that brings law enforcement and community agencies together with the common goals of safety, understanding, care, and services for people experiencing a crisis in their lives. So within the New Bedford CCT, we have meetings once a month people from any number of facets. So I work for the Department of Mental Health. There are people there from the Department of Developmental Services. There are people there from the Department of Children and Families, people from the Bristol County Sheriff's Department, um, the Housing Authority, elderly services, any number of you know, uh, local community outreach programs, any number of services are coming together at the table at least once a month. And we're all able to kind of bring cases forward and you know triage so for instance i had a case one day while doing a ride along with the police department it was an 80 something year old woman who had kind of taken off from the home she was experiencing some early onset al alzheimer's that's not something that i'm necessarily um up on so you know i brought the case forward to the ccit team where i knew that elderly services would be there and see if they were able to help and so actually elderly services and the bristol county sheriff's department were able to come together get her the uh, silver alert that she needed, as well as get her the ongoing services that she would need. Um, there is also the mental health first aid, which is an eight hour course that gives people the skills to help someone who is developing a mental health problem or experiencing a mental health crisis. The evidence behind the program demonstrates that it does build mental health literacy, helping the public identify, understand, and respond to signs of mental illness. And then I'm going to get more in depth in the co-responder and the ride along because that's what I do. Next. So the co-responder model um, is police will contact me. Um, so sometimes I'm sitting at the stations um, and all the officers are already out or, you know, that was pre-COVID. Now during COVID, I've been actually sitting more at home and the officers or dispatch will call me directly from a scene to triage something or to ask me to go out to an actual scene. Um, so 
during, uh, you know, one time they had called me for an eight year old who was out of control within the home. So I met them there. Um, I was able to assess the situation, find out that she did have providers already out in the community. I asked mom for verbal permission so that way I could outreach those providers to let them know that there was a police response. This is what happened so that that way they can continue to follow up within the home. I also recently had an, um, a sister, the police were at a scene during this COVID time. And, you know, they had the sister, you know, they called me from the home and I spoke to the sister of an 18 year old who, you know, he was, he actually was looking for suicide by, uh, by police. And so they were, you know, I triaged it over the phone. He was sent to the hospital, but then I followed up with the sister the following day, you know, and then a couple of days later to find out what ended up happening with him. Um, he did end up going inpatient to a locked facility hospital. Um, and, you know, I was able to kind of put in a referral for services for them. It can also be an officer sending me an email for follow-up. Maybe they responded to a call on the overnight or on a time that I wasn't working and they just want me to kind of do some follow-up, make the fam, you know, help get the family connected to resources within the community. Next. So during the actual ride along, um, in order for this program to achieve its greatest success, there has to be trust and respect between officers and clinicians. So when I first started this program, because I was the first one to do this, um, you know, this was something brand new. Unfortunately, there was a, a trust, lack of trust relationship between the administration and the officer. So they weren't sure why I was there. Um, you know, so I kind of made jokes about it as, you know, I'm not a spy, I'm not a mole, I'm not collecting intel to bring it to the corner office. You know, and that really just kind of like bring, you know, brought down some of the temperature in the room. Um, and as trust and respect grew, the more likely an officer was able to call me for assistance. Now they start to see the work that I can do. I think about the first time I actually, an officer actually took me out with them in the car. Um, it was about a, a month or so into the program because I pretty much was just kind of sitting there. And as soon as the officers would come in, it would get really quiet. Um, and then as time went on and we built that trust and we built those relationships, you know, by the end of it, they were inviting me over for like dinner and they're texting me like, hey, I know you're out on a call, but this is where we're gonna order from dinner. Do you want anything tonight? Um, so I remember even that first ride along the officer, you know, we were engaging in conversation, just, you know, oh, tell me about your family, tell me about vacations, like how long have you been an officer and sharing, you know, back the same information. And we got back to the station and he was just like, oh, you know what? She's actually not bad. I'm like, I'm standing right here. Um, he's like, you know, she asks a lot of questions, but she also gives answers. So I looked at him and said, well, that's called a conversation dialogue. Um, but, you know, and from there, you know, that gate, you know, when it, once an officer was able to validate me, that then gave permission for other officers to be like, hey, yeah, sure, I'll take you along for a ride along. Um, and when we're doing these ride alongs, I'm responding with them to whatever calls are going on, you know, so if it's a domestic violence, if it's a neighbor dispute, if it is someone on an overdose, if it's um, any number of things, I am, you know, it could be someone blocking the driveway. Um, and then unless something else is going on within the city and they call for me directly, then that officer will usually, you know, bring me to that scene. Um, you know, so, you know, some reflections as to some of the things that have happened while doing the ride alongs. I remember this one time there was a physical altercation between a 15 year old girl and her mother. Um, the police could have arrested her for uh, assault and battery some kind of domestic violence charge, but we were able to identify natural support. She had a dad who lived out of town who was actually on his way to the home. We were able to get her to go with dad. Um, and then we were able to also then connect with her current providers and then send out referrals for additional services and treatment within the home. And last I knew that was a, that was probably like two years ago, last I knew um, they were doing really well. So that intervention really helped and that could have you know, been detrimental to her future. Um, it's, you know, um, yeah, so that's that one. Next. While on the scene, it's important to um, make sure that the scene is safe and secure. So I often think of domestic violence when looking at domestic violence situations that can actually be some of the most lethal responses that an officer can go on. 
So for those, I stand back and I wait for them to secure the scene and then call me in, you know, whether it's to provide additional support to the victim or, um, you know, sometimes it's even to the children or it's other people who were in the home. It's not always necessarily like the person that the call was identified for. Sometimes it's for the people who are around. Um, so helping to stabilize the scene using appropriate de-escalation strategies. So it's really about calming people down, using my tone, using my body language, not being seen as a threat, you know, just really, it's hard to yell at somebody who's just talking to you. Um, you know, so I, I just check all of that at the door. I'm in there to calm them down, um, respectfully listen, offer suggestions, recommendations. Um, recognizing and interpreting behavioral reactions and verbal responses that may reveal an underlying mental health issue. If you recall in the, um, the opening documentary we just watched, the officer, when he was talking to her, he could see that she was kind of looking off to the corner um, and almost like staring off. And he, you know, he was able to recognize that she's responding to some kind of internal stimuli, um, you know, either hearing things or seeing things. And he's able to ask that. Um, communicating with the individual and others at the scene, right? So in that scene, we also saw him talking to the husband, you know, talking to any kind of family, friends, anyone who's around trying to get any kind of history. Have they had, you know, do they have a diagnosis? What is that diagnosis? Are they on, on me any medications? Sometimes they might not know, know the diagnosis, but if they know the medications, there are just some common medications that we know about. Um, and based off of that, I can tell more or less what the diagnosis is you know, any other self-injurious behaviors, any, you know, and usually when I ask the question about have you engaged in any self-injurious behaviors, I'm looking for any kind of cutting, head banging, scratching, burning, picking, pulling, anything that they're inflicting self um, injuries to them, you know, on them, on their body. Um, and that's not necessarily a suicidal um, action. It's, um, it's more of a emotional release action. Um, but that's a whole other topic. Um, you know, also looking at, is there any substance use? You know, and what kind of substances are they using? And what is that about? Um, and then, you know, ultimately I, you know, I jokingly say I'm a tool on the officer's tool belt, something that they can use. So I make a recommendation. Um, ultimately it is up to the officers whether or not they choose to follow my recommendation, whether it's to send someone to the hospital, um, keep them home with referrals to resources, or just collaborating with current providers. Um, and like I said, sometimes I'm also providing information and resources for the family and friends who are present. Next. So with this collaboration, there comes some training for police officers. Um, so, you know, knowing about the program inception. So when this program first started here in New Bedford, I went to, we have three police stations within the city. I went to all three police stations during all three roll calls um, so that that way I can introduce myself, introduce the program, give them some kind of level of familiarity. I also, that first year of the program, during their weekly 40 hour in service, I spent every single Friday with a group of officers, again, introducing this program, letting them know about behavioral and you know, things to be looking for when responding to mental health calls and what kind of service I can, I can provide for them. Um, you know, teaching the officers, like I said, about the signs and symptoms of mental illness, you know, letting them know what some commonly prescribed medication. So if someone says, you know, I'm on Clozeril, then that's going to ring a bell that that's someone who's suffering from or um, diagnosed with schizophrenia. You know, some de-escalation techniques, you know, how we position our bodies, how we speak to people. Um, our facial expressions, all of that, all those non-verbal non cues um, can really help to de-escalate a, a conversation. You know, I remember having an officer tell me like, oh, we've got, you know, we got to get you a vest and we got to get you a gun and all these things. And I was like, I'm a social worker. Like I go in with pen and paper, like that's in my cell phone. That's pretty much all I walk into a home. It's very non-confrontational. Um, knowing the statutory issues. So in Massachusetts, a commitment for mental health is called a section 12. So that is for someone who is at serious risk of harming themselves or others. Um, and then we also have the section 35, which is someone whose substance use is um, placing them at risk of dying themselves. You know, also about death notifications, making sure that officers know 
how to have those really tough conversations, you know, having to notify a family um, that one of their loved ones have passed isn't an easy conversation. So making sure that they're trained on how to do that. And so a lot of it is just osmosis. Those conversations that we're having in the car, um, they just, you know, I, I often hope and wonder, and I know it has happened, um, that officers just start to soften a little bit so that that way they can be more effective in the conversations that they're having with the people in the community and just seeing things a little bit differently. Um, I often joke with them and say, you know, officers see things in Thing, see things in black and white, and I'm social worker gray. Um, and so just trying to see things through different lenses and sharing that those experiences. Next. There's also training that has to happen for the clinician. Um, you know, orientation to the culture of the police agencies. Like I said, there are three stations within New Bedford and each one of them has a very different culture. Um, one of the stations, you know, they order dinner together just about every single night. Another one of the stations, they order well, probably half the time. Um, another station, they literally like never order together. They never eat together. But for whatever reason, each station has developed its own culture. And so I need to know when I walk into that station on that particular night, what the culture is like within there. So that, that way I know how I can um, blend in. Knowing the chain of command and the roles and responsibilities of patrol officers. Um, you know, within the New Bedford Police Department, our chain of command is the patrol officer, the sergeant, lieutenant, captain, deputy chief, and chief. Um, that's the way that it works here. So I always, you know, look out to see who's the commanding officer of the night and where they, you know, if they have someone identified for me to go out with or how they want it to roll that night. It really is an officer-driven program. I'm not going to you know, push myself onto anybody or anything like that. Um, I really let them seek me out because that, that empowers them. Knowing the police protocols and policies governing the role and responsibilities of a social worker in the police environment, right? So we really talk about like safety and, you know, like some officers are like, hey, you wanna, you know, jump out of this call with me. Other officers are like, hey, you stay here. I'll call you if I need you. I need to know that and I need to respect that decision. Um, radio, proce radio procedures, so in New Bedford, knowing what some of the calls are. So if I hear a 45 has come over the radio, I know that that's an emotionally disturbed person. Um, if I hear a Q5, I know that that's a suicidal person. Um, making sure that we protect the privacy of quarry information, because I do have access to police records, um, as well as, you know, review of patrol procedures. Next. And so I just wanna leave you with this one final thought is that our prime pur purpose in this life is to help others. And if you can't help them, at least don't hurt them. The Dalai Lama. Thank you and I am complete. Wonderful, thank you, Melissa, so much. That's such important and good information. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll come back uh, and give you a chance to sort of reflect uh, uh, after our next two respondents. Uh, I wanna remind everyone, please use the chat for any questions you may have and we'll load them up for our panelists. I'm gonna now turn to uh, Deputy Superintendent of Police, Carlton Kane, who was employed uh, with the Niagara Falls Police Department for more than 31 years. Uh, he has held assignments in patrol, street crimes, housing, internal affairs, community relations, and served as co-director of the Niagara County Law Enforcement Academy. Deputy Superintendent Kane oversaw the Office of Professional Standards, Community Relations, and Use of Force Analysis. We can't even begin to list the number of community-based programs that he initiated and implemented, but safe to say the Deputy uh, Superintendent Kane was instrumental in getting the police department's command staff into direct one-on-one -on -one interaction with the various communities in Niagara Falls. So welcome Deputy Superintendent Kane. Thank you for the invite, it's uh, nice to be here. In Niagara Falls, we've always used um, mental health practitioners, but I like the way where it's going now where they're more based in the patrol vehicle. Um, we had a history of always just calling. And of course, you know, once you call, a lot of times it takes 45 minutes to an hour for someone to get dressed and get there. I think now 
having them in the vehicle is more expedient, practical, but I think also we should continuously look at the data and improve our programs. Like Melissa said, you know, more training, um, look at what are we doing now, how effective it is, perhaps we need more, perhaps we can send them out to various type trainings and have more CCT programs, even in our local departments. That's my statement. Thank you, Carl. Julie, you ready? <laughs> um, all right, uh, uh, Lieutenant Julie Kratz has been employed by the Niagara County Sheriff's Office since March of 2012 and has spent most of her career assigned to road patrol. She is a drug recognition expert, field training officer, police instructor, and member of the Niagara County Sheriff's Office Accident Investigation Unit. Deputy Kratz was promoted to Lieutenant in January of 2019 and has been the co-director here at the Academy since June of 2020. Welcome, Lieutenant Kratz. Thank you. So, um, Melissa, you talked a lot about um, police training. I would be the go-to person in Niagara County regarding police officer training. So first I'll get into um, what the recruits get in the basic course for police um, in regards to mental health training and responding to mental health emergencies. So DCGS actually requires uh, 20 hours in fundamental crisis intervention for law enforcement. That's the actual name of the course. It's given to all recruits at the Niagara County Law Enforcement Academy. So we're required from DCGS to do 20 hours. We go above and beyond and we do more. We implement role plays into that training, which is really good for the recruits. It's not just PowerPoint. They're actually um, learning how to speak to people who are having mental health emergencies. Um, we also recently added, and this is required by the state as well, um, a 16 hour block on officer wellness, which focuses on actually the mental health of the officers themselves, um, suicide prevention for officers, and just taking care of yourselves after um, seeing a lot of traumatic things that we see on the job. So, um, so that's what they get in a basic course for police. Um, we do offer a lot of training for our sworn officers that have been on the job for a while and they have general field knowledge and they've been out there working. Um, we offer a five-day course called Crisis Intervention Training. Um, it's really, really, really good training. I actually took the course uh, about two years ago. Um, it focuses a lot about empathy when you're talking to people who are having mental health crisis issues. Um, and for example, it's, it's something that you, somebody tells you that they want to kill yourself you want to immediately say to them, no, you really don't want to do that. It's just instinctive to want to say that. And this course teaches you the right thing to say, which is, I see that you're very frustrated and actually um, validating their emotions and, instead of telling them that they don't really want to do it. And it's not a bad intention on the officer. It's just not the right thing to say. And that's something that I actually didn't know. So I learned a lot in that class. Um, we also were given, um, a bunch of referrals that we can give to people who are having crisis issues. We have a very good relationship, and I say we as in the Niagara County Sheriff's Office, we have a very good relationship with Niagara County Crisis Services. Um, they issue a stack of these cards to everybody and all patrol officers, and we will issue them to people who are having issues because um, we're not therapists, but we can get them into contact with the right people whether it be crisis services, um, substance abuse treatment, juvenile problems. Um, we have a lot of dementia patients that we can refer to adult protective services for lots of issues like that. So um, I think that's all I have. That's all I wanted to say. Any questions? All right, so we'll, we'll, um, we're, we're looking for questions, put them in the chat. You know, I, I, as I'm listening to the conversation here, I want to, um, I wanna ask uh, Deputy Superintendent Kane a question. Um, and then Melissa, if you could follow up and uh, let us know if we have, if, to your knowledge, if we have something like this 
for police officers in New Bedford. Um, so, uh, Deputy Superintendent Kane, um, catch a falling star program. Um, I, I know. Um, I mean, I'm a, I have a little bit of familiarity with that, and I'm um, I'm not sure how much you do, but um, could, would you be able to speak a little bit about that, or what sorts of um, mental health services do we actually have in place to support our police officers? Yeah, that, that program has been around for a long time. And what it does is focuses on the mental health of officers or even staff at the various uh, local police departments. It's hard to get data on the program because in order to encourage officers and other staff to use it, we don't collect data. So they have a point person that they talk to and that person who is not a mental health professional but more just a liaison, knows all the right people to talk to, will point them in different directions and help them out. And what happens with us is usually a couple times a year, we'll just ask, hey, is there any of our staff using the services? And they'll report back, yes, but we won't know exactly how many, et cetera. Um, what's going on in Niagara Falls now, though, is to piggyback on the on that program is to actually have uh, what we call a pastors and police uh, collaborative where pastors come into the department and, and other clergy come into the department and ride with the police officers and deal with the mental health within the police department and also when we go on any calls of bereavement etc so it's like a quasi mental health program that's just starting now Okay, uh, and, and Melissa, are you seeing anything like that? Is there a similar program in place that you know of or, or services like that in New Bedford? So they have the uh, EAP, the Employee Assistance Program um, that officers are able to access and utilize. I it's a struggle because I've had numerous conversations with officers about utilization of it. There's a lot of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like hesitation for using that service because they're afraid it's going to get back to the chief and how's that going to be used against them. There is a whole culture around mental health for themselves and their own officer wellness. I will say prior to my starting the, um, with this department, the three previous years they had lost an officer to suicide. Um, while I've been there, they have not. I'd like to think it's because of me. Um, but <laughs> I wouldn't go there, but I am there as much for the officers as I am for the community members. And I think that that's where a lot of that like trust and respect and relationship goes into, right? Like I've had officers disclose to me, you know, whether it's family issues that they're having at home, um, thing, you know, their childhood, you know, whether it's being adopted and they're reconnecting with their families, um, what that process is like, hey, Melissa, can I talk to you? So they're talking to me off the clock, on the clock, however they can, you know, utilize me. And, you know, so a lot of the work has been with the officers themselves and trying to, um, you know, help them to realize that mental health is just this, right? It's, it's conversations, it's processing, um, there's no shame. So really trying to work to reduce the shame, stigma and guilt around mental health. Um, it's not seen, you know, so to reduce it's being seen as some sort of weakness if they need to talk to a counselor or a social worker, um, but otherwise it's a way of gaining insight and processing what they go through, you know, they do suffer. You know, I can remember numerous conversations I've had with officers where they're recounting some traumatic event that they've responded to, whether it was a young person who died by suicide and they were the responding officer and what, you know, what that scene was like for them to show up to. And they are able to recount it in such detail. So that to me, you know, without them saying it, that to me shows signs of some kind of PTSD, right? Um, or I remember another officer recounting a horrific car accident that he had been to. And, you know, unfortunately someone was dismembered during this car accident and he spoke about it. And like, he had that far off look in his eyes, you know? And so we talked about that and what that was like for him. And even, I know there was a, sometimes I'll get word that there's something going on while I'm not working. And I'm reaching out to the officer saying, Hey, I heard you were responding on this. Are you okay? You know, it's okay to not, to not be okay. You know, I'm here for you. I'm just as much here for you as I am for the community. Because um, if we can work on that, then they're gonna be better as they go out and service the community. Um, they also do have a peer support. So if there is any kind of traumatic event that they have responded to, they can outreach to their peers um, and do some kind of peer support. 
And we also have um, some chaplains involved with the department that they get together. Um, and you know, sometimes it's for the community, sometimes it's for officers. Okay. Great, thank you. Uh, I think I think we have a question in the chat, Kyle. Yes. So, and first, thank you to uh, Carl, Melissa, and Julie for your time so far and, and being able to to go through and, and each speak on, on each of your parts here. I will, um, I'm from the admissions office, so I want to thank everybody for, for staying tuned in here so far. Um, and as we are going through, we have some questions already in the chat. I encourage if you have thought of anything or if there's anything in particular you would like to ask, you can feel free to type it in the chat box um, as we're going through the questions. I did see one um, come in so far. Um, and the question was asked by Caroline, um, and I, I'll open it up to the three panelists. If um, any three of you, all three of you, if one of you wants to jump at it, um, please please let me know. So the question from Caroline is, what is the screening process like for hiring new officers? And what changes have occurred or are occurring in light of recent events? I'm gonna decline this one because I do not hire police officers. <laughs> question for me. So um, the screening process in, involves um, background checks, uh, fingerprinting, psychological testing, and um, physical fitness as well um, as an oral interview and written exam. So there's a lot that goes into it. It's very time consuming and it's very in-depth. Um, the question, what changes have occurred or are occurring in light of recent recent events. I don't know if you're referring to in the screening process because the screening process really hasn't changed at all. Um, there are some changes that have occurred um, in regards to the training that we offer in the academy and the, the, it's all statewide. It's changing because of police reform and all the things that are going on. Um, so there's some things that have been added to the curriculum um, specifically with um, the mental health training. Um, statewide, we have more mental health training. We have differences with our defensive tactics. Um, after the George Floyd incident, they, we took out the shoulder pin restraint in our defensive tactics curriculum, and that was an executive order by the governor. Um, officer wellness is a new one, and we're constantly being updated with the um, Municipal Police Training Council and DCGS. So uh, we follow the state rules with the training and then we also go above and beyond and we add extra hours in on things that we think that are more important. Um, so we add extra emergency vehicle operations training, extra um, mental health, extra defensive tactics, physical fitness, and lots of other things. Be too long to list. Thank you, Julie. Appreciate it and, and going through that. Um, and Caroline says thank you as well. So I looks like we haven't seen any other questions coming in there. And sometimes it takes a little bit to warm up and, and get the courage to, to ask a question. So we'll, you know, I want you to feel free that you all the questions are welcome. And if you don't feel comfortable sending it to everyone, you could send it to me privately if, if that's more comfortable for you. I know I wasn't the big hand raiser uh, in class all the time. I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> Criminal Justice Department can recall that. Um, but I will turn it over um, to anyone else in the, the panel. I know uh, maybe some of the faculty members or anybody might have any questions at this time. I don't know, Dr. Taylor, if you had anything or tell I do, I, well, I do, uh, but, but yeah, I want to, um, you know, give the panel members uh, an opportunity to ask each other questions. So uh, Melissa, Julie, Carl, if you have questions for each other, uh, jump in now, otherwise I have a I have a question. I'm going to look for the little red button to disappear. <laughs> well, let me let me ask my question, and then um, so you know I, I I'm just sort of glancing at at the uh, the chat room. I, I I know a lot of the students on here are first year students, and I I had a previous conversation with Julie. Right, who's only been out for about ten years, and asked her, you know, if she were, if she were, if she could go back, would she, um, would she change anything? And for the most part, I think you said largely, no. You you were, I think, a criminal justice major, sociology minor, um, but 
Carl, what about, I mean, what about you? Do you have, so one of the reasons we, we put this together was to help our first year students and, and even some prospective students who are thinking about a criminal justice degree. Um, you know, are there, are, are there any lessons from this conversation of maybe some things that students should think about adding with their criminal justice major? I mean, you don't have to necessarily be a double major, um, but because it seems to me that the skills are most important. So I'll offer this up to, to Carl first and then uh, Julia or Melissa, please jump in. I, I think any chance a student gets to take any paralegal related courses would actually help them out. Um, I was a paralegal in the military and I could just say that the training that I got from that really helped me out when it came time to prepare to do informations and to go to court and to do your own research. As you know, police departments are really hurting budget wise. And when there's new court cases that come out, you just can't take the press's word for what the court ruling was. You have to be able to have that ability to look up these Supreme Court cases, to read the cases, get the analysis, and then apply them to your police work. Unfortunately, we don't have the staff to do that for you. So having, for me, having a paralegal background and being able to do my own legal research and then to run that research a lot of times through the district attorney and then pass it on the police department has has paid dividends. It really has. Okay, that's that great. That's recommendation. Yeah, fantastic. Um, Julie or Melissa? I'm a sociology undergrad. <laughs> so I think anything that's like within the sociology to really understand societies and communities and how they operate, as well as anything like within the psychology, um, you know, anything that, or even I know Niagara U has a social work program. So any courses within that, that really help to identify some of those de-escalation skills, identifying mental health issues, um, you know, psychopharmacology, anything, anything in those realms that give you some of that skill so that, that when you go out and you're dealing with the public and, you know, sometimes you'll be dealing with the public that isn't necessarily, you know, something that you're familiar with you know, we're, we're dealing with all different kinds of backgrounds. No two people are the same. Um, and nobody is more than their worst crime, you know? So, um, you know, just really thinking that even though you're, you may be coming across someone who has, who has done an illegal act, they are more than that illegal act. They are more than the liar, more than the thief, more than the murderer, more than whatever. They have families, they have homes, they probably have extensive trauma history. Um, and so just bringing some of that empathy along with the work that you do. Awesome, thank you so much. Uh, looks like we have a couple other questions rolling in here too. Um, I have one here from Tia, hi Tia. Um, Tia also a class, former classmate of mine. Uh, is, the question is, is there a training that covers or is directed towards cultural competency for policing in urban communities. She has follow up. Has there been any initiatives designed for officers to be able to effectively police in neighborhoods where citizens may not look at them on the calls they responded to? I think this will be another good question for me. So um, we have a training that's required by the state. It's called um, cultural diversity. Um, it's included with bias related incidents and sexual harassment. Um, we have Mark Sanders from Lockport Police. He's a chaplain. He's not a police officer. He's uh, the chaplain for Lockport PD. He comes in, does a really, really good job teaching this course. Um, it's required five hours, but we usually do more hours than that. He comes in and he talks a lot about the different cultures that police may encounter and how to appropriately interact with those different cultures. Um, we also do classes on um, persons with disabilities. Um, and that includes a wide range of disabilities, whether it be blind, deaf, um, mental illness, and et cetera. Uh, we also have a course on um, elder abuse. We have um, veterans come in that have suffered from PTSD and they come in with their, um, with their service dogs and they give the police recruits a lecture on how to appropriately um, interact with them and what services can be provided to them. 
we also actually have a, through our dispatch, a translator service when we come into contact with uh, people that don't speak English and they need police assistance. Um, I can think of one example of myself. I responded to a domestic incident with uh, a Russian family in Wheatfield and they did not speak any English at all. I called dispatch. They were able to identify the language and immediately get me on the phone with the translator. And I just put my cell phone on speakerphone and was able to translate what was going on and be able to figure out what the problem was inside the residence and talk to them effectively. So we have a lot of really, really good training here and we hope to expand on it in the future. Julie, thank you so much for being able to give us some insight on, uh, can, um, can what, I what's going back on. Off, Julie? Yeah, can absolutely, I please, please do. I, um, T, I think what you may also be referring to is what goes on yearly in police departments. Um, most of the police departments like Niagara Falls and I know the Sheriff's Department do annual in-service training where they set aside certain hours to deal with uh, recurrent training. And one of those trainings uh, with our department and I know with the Sheriff's Department is implicit bias and other things. And what most departments now are doing, what like we've been doing for years, is you send one or two officers out to get the certification. And then what happens is they become the certified instructors and they come back and then they present that training in the annual basis to the entire department for in-service training. So that's a follow-up when you talk about what's going on in local communities, whatever this national training is, believe me, officers are gonna get certified and bring it back to their department. And that's not something you would necessarily see in an academy but you will definitely see it in the in-service and the growth of the law enforcement. For example, Melissa talks about, you know, the mental health training. What you're going to see now is many officers, many departments, what they'll do is they'll send someone to get that training and then come back and train their, their departments because that's the most cost-effective way. Carl, thanks. I'm happy you're able to, to jump in there as well and add on, I appreciate it. Next we have coming in here um, is specifically again on police training and the question is is there a difference in training when it comes to the size or area of police department for example does the sheriff's department have different training compared to urban police departments so i'll start this one off um so i can only speak for new york state training um everybody in new york state gets the same police academy curriculum it's required by DCGS to have those required hours. So um, it's all broken down by subject. We have to have a certain amount of hours. Usually the academies choose to add hours in certain areas. Um, so we all have the same ones. However, we will add certain things. So the Niagara County law enforcement will include Niagara Falls PD, North Tonawanda PD, Lockport Sheriff's Office and um, some smaller departments, some could be coming from Erie County, Genesee. So we actually have a wide range. We'll have Barker PD come in to train with us, which is a very, very rural agency with maybe five officers altogether. And then we have another agency recruit sitting right next to them. And there's 140 officers with, within that agency. So um, we may tweak it a little bit um, in certain areas to... Um, instruct differently because rural agencies may run into different um, issues than um, larger cities, but we all have the same curriculum. And maybe the departmental in-service training would be different um, in regards to rural versus urban police department. So I can say from Massachusetts training, um, there are only so many academies throughout the entire state and so you're getting officers from all different departments all over the cities, towns that are going to the same police academies as from Massachusetts. Um, and so they're all getting the same more or less academy experience. Um, and then during their yearly 40 hour in service, part of that is determined by the, the Massachusetts something or other, the, their criminal justice um, area. So I think it's, I think like three or four out of the five days is determined by them. And then each local district has autonomy over that last day or two over what kind of things that they want to address. That's why two years ago, three years ago, when I started this program, I was brought in to do the mental health piece of it because that was something that was New Bedford specific. 
So the uh, um, departments do have some leeway as to what kind of training they choose to offer on their yearly basis. Anyone else? Carl, are you good? All right. Uh, well, I see that we're a few minutes after five o'clock and I don't want to keep anyone. Uh, I think it's been uh, a really enlightening. I've, I've really learned a lot from the presenters. Um, I want to thank the presenters. And of course, Melissa coming all the way from New Bedford <laughs> to speak to us. And I, I really, I, I do appreciate it. Um, we have contact information for uh, each of the presenters. If anyone wanted to reach out uh, individually to them, I'm sure they would welcome any, any questions or comments that you may have. I wanna thank Brian uh, uh, and Kyle for assisting us and the team that put this together. Uh, and uh, so if, if, if there's nothing else and I don't see anything else in the chat, uh, I want to wish everyone a great night. And if you're on campus, come over and get some fried dough outside of O'Shea Hall. Uh, thank you all and uh, look forward to more uh, of these events and this partnership between uh, the Criminal Justice Department and Career Services. And we are recording this as well. So we can always make this available for anyone who needs it. So thank you everyone. And I'll turn it over to Brian to close it.